Good afternoon, ladies uh, and gentlemen. <coughs> My name is uh, Rami Dayab. I'm the regional director for US Green Council for Middle East and Africa Regional <coughs> Office, based in uh, Tunis, uh, Tunisia. I'm glad to meet you today and uh, appreciate uh, seeing the connection uh, putting us in continuous touch to make sure that the business remains to function on a regular basis. As you know, the US Green Council uh, was launching a webinar series to address a range of uh, industry issues. I would like to thank you all for joining uh, us this webinar on uh, risk management, corn and grain supply and demand market outlook, hosted by the Council. And I hope that you, you will enjoy uh, both presentations by uh, Dr. Guy Allen, IGP Senior Economist at Kansas State University, and uh, Dr. Dan uh, O'Brien, Extension Agriculture Economist at Kansas State University. Too. Both of them will give uh, us uh, also a summary perspective on U.S. domestic grain market info. Last uh, Friday, July 10th, uh, USDA supply and demand report. Following both uh, presentations, we will open uh, 15 minutes uh, discussions for questions and answers. In time, uh, please feel free to check on uh, Q&E box on Zoom and uh, send them your question. Both uh, Daniel and uh, Guy will be happy to reply to you during this webinar on, uh, or later by email. Now, uh, let me uh, please introduce uh, Dr. Uh, Guy Allen. Uh, thank you, Rami, and um, good morning, everyone. Um, I sent out a package of this presentation last night. I'm just going to touch base on the, uh, the highlights on this, and uh, hope there's uh, a number of things I just want to touch base on, and then we can go in depth in any areas that you'd like to here, uh, here at, the, at the end. So I'm assuming that screen sharing is working now at the moment. Uh, briefly, I want to take a look at two things this morning. One, I want to have a look at the U.S. Uh, uh, situation to, or the world corn situation, uh, focus in on, on that. And then I want to focus in a bit more on China. I think China is going to be the key driver here going forward uh, as we uh, confirm the size of the U.S. crop. Uh, I think we're going to move to the demand side of things. and. Uh, so those are the topics I want to touch base on briefly this morning. Uh, I think it's a good good Monday to, to start this. Friday's headline was China books the second biggest uh, U.S. corn purchase on record, also buys wheat. Uh, this is, this is uh, good information. We saw the market a bit weaker on Friday following uh, what we've seen as a fairly good good rally. But I want to expand on this, this China headline uh, at, at the end of my part of the uh, presentation. <laughs> uh, these are the macro issues that I think are driving the market that we need to look at. Uh, not too much different than last month. We're still looking at the impact of COVID. African swine fever, and there's a bit of a new development there. Uh, the U.S. currency and exchange rates, as always, trade tensions and negotiations are still in the forefront, as well as the, the uh, gravity of the U.S. political uh, situation as we approach November, November elections. Um, just to recap of changes in the U.S. balance sheet, not a lot of major changes in the U.S. balance sheet here, but we're looking, looking at a few that need to highlight. They, they did bring back global production, although uh, it's still at a record level. We're touching a, a number of new records on this, this whole situation as uh, as we uh, look, look to move forward. <clears throat> We've got world production that was, um, it's still up about 50 million metric tons from last year at uh, 1,163,000,000 metric tons, but it's down about 25 million from last month. Um, world trade estimated again to be at a record about 182 million metric tons for corn. And uh, stocks to use situation while a bit tighter, it's still at 27%. Uh, stocks to use ratio, which is still quite loose and quite comfortable. <clears throat> Looking at the harvested area, harvested area was, was uh, dropped to only about 2 million hectares from a month ago. 
still a reasonable, you know, a, a record number, but a little, a little less than what we saw last month. The biggest changes was, was in the U.S., and I'm going to let Dan expand on the U.S. situation uh, following the look on the inter international situation. <clears throat> World production, as I said, is going to be, be at a record level. Uh, again, the, the mix in that, the big changes we're seeing is an increase in U.S. from last year, um, a not noted increase in Brazil and, the, and Ukraine and Mexico, and while we're seeing declines in South Africa, particularly on the back of dry, dry weather in, in that area. On the wake of that, as well as low prices, we're expecting to see uh, record world consumption. Um, consumption will reach uh, 1,154,000 uh, metric tons, uh, which is a new record. This is being driven particularly by the livestock sector, which I'll touch base on a bit, but we're also seeing a good rebound in, in the ethanol sector and the energy sectors that recovers with uh, some stronger oil prices there. And that oil, crude oil complex has seemed to, to settle down a bit. We put profitability back in the third and fourth quarter uh, ethanol production, and we're starting to see hedges being placed out there as well as uh, reach it into the, to the new year. This is the feed number. Look, we're seeing a noted increase in the feed number at, uh, Seven, 727 million uh, metric tons. Uh, that's a new record that's up quite notably from, from last year and remaining strong from, from last month. Uh, so that will continue to drive the situation and China is gonna, going to be a key component in that as their imports of, of meat continue to re remain quite strong. Uh, global ending stock situation. As I said, we're down slightly. Uh, stocks to use ratio is about just over 27%. Um, it's still, uh, look across that graph, quite strong. It's actually up slightly after a four-year decline. And I'm really not going to get too bullish price, uh, the price outlook, unless we get that, that global ending stocks down to about, two, as we approach 200 uh, uh, million metric tons of carryover stocks. <clears throat> and I will comment on that when we when we get to China. A big, a in big, big question comes to what the carryover stocks are in China, and I think that could be a, a significant adjustment in China's numbers uh, coming on that. The market in China is just not acting like they have the stocks that they they have indicated. Big change that we see is what we've increased the carryover stocks in the U.S. We've seen a decrease. In, in China, so that's uh, for the most part an offsetting situation on that. Again, we look at who's, who's holding the world ending stocks, China's being the biggest one on that. We tend to take those out, look at the situation uh, without China, and uh, those, uh, as I mentioned earlier, ending stocks are, are coming up by about 10 million metric tons from the year before, even, even without China. Moving on to world trade, <clears throat> imports and global trade uh, is looking to be a uh, record number. We're looking at about 177 uh, million metric tons of, uh, of global trade, which is, uh, which is a good number. And I think it speaks to uh, U.S. Grains Council's, uh, our need and capacity to continue to remain quite busy, even in, in the wake of uh, the current environment. Uh, there's going to be some uh, some noted noted changes in that. Uh, just from month to month, we're seeing uh, Canadian imports up about uh, half a million tons. Uh, Kenya is dropping their their number in half, uh, dropping about 500 500,000 metric tons to about uh, 500,000 metric tons. Year on year, the big change in this is, is Europe. And I think that European situation is being driven by the, the corn wheat price relationship. Less wheat's going to go in the feeding, corn's going to go in, and there's, uh, we continue to see good prices for uh, wheat, particularly the soft, softer wheat 
situation there as well. Dan might, might comment on that. Also, uh, good increases in Mexico, Iran, uh, Egypt. Um, again, those I think are Mexico particularly is being driven by the uh, underlying uh, feed, feed complex. <coughs> I'll skip exporting countries here. Just touch base on Brazil. This is Brazilian exports. They're up. Brazil is going to continue to be a strong exporter in, the, in this coming year. And I think that's probably the biggest threat to U.S. exports as they're sort of in our back, backyard. Uh, and we'll continue to keep an eye on uh, Brazilian sales as, as we move forward on that. Ukraine is also setting a, expected to set a new record for, for exports as well as, as it's up as the Black Sea area continues to grow in export competitiveness, not only in wheat, but in, in oil seeds and grains as well. This is the world price relationships uh, at the moment. Not too many differences there. I will highlight sort of the, uh, the changes in the spread relationship. Uh, Argentine corn seems to be quite discounted. Black Sea still at a, at a quite a big premium and uh, would expect to see uh, that Black Sea situation uh, sitting there at least till we get till, till October. Now moving on to China, I will, uh, will say I did have a good conversation with Brian uh, Lomar just to get some understanding in, into China. China always remains a bit of a mystery and it's, it, it is uh, speculation. Here's China balance sheet as presented by the USDA. I think every trader in China has quite a, quite a different balance sheet. There's some comments on the back of this or under following this on changes in the supply and demand situations reflected by the USDA. For China, we sort of use USDA as the baseline and then, then argue, our, argue our point from, uh, from there. Again, the ending stocks number for China, I think, the the biggest question on the balance sheet, and I've heard comments from the trade that it could be as much as 100 million metric tons overstated. Um, so I think, uh, and, and the domestic market in China is, is effectively ants are acting that way. Uh, the big driver is the recovery of the swine sector and how much feed's going to be consumed in, in the swine sector. These are the USDA numbers. Um, the, I've always been quite dismissive of the recovery in the swine sector, uh, not believing it's going to recover as fast as a lot of people are suggesting. Uh, talking to some colleagues in China last night, maybe I'm a bit too, too hard on that. Uh, there is a very big push to recover that, that pork production in China. This is the split. The, However, coming down to the total grain consumption that the USDA put out, I think that's probably pretty much in line and not going to, uh, to argue with that too much <laughs> at this point in time. I do need to note, there has been talk last week of a new strain of China uh, swine flu. This is probably closely related to the bird flu. I don't think there's a big issue on this at the moment, but it's definitely on the radar, and I think we just need to be, be aware of that. That these sort of events aren't uncommon, but uh, and we just need to stay stay close to it, particularly as that recovery. This is China's ending stock number. This is the big question mark, and I just don't know quite where we're at on that. I don't know if it necessarily makes a lot of difference, except we're probably running that tank closer to empty than than we are to uh, the full. I think the key things to watch is watch the price signals in in the domestic market in China. Markets are usually pretty efficient and pretty right, and current prices would continue to suggest we're going to import a good number, uh, probably a bigger amount of U.S. corn in this coming year than what most people people expect. <coughs> um, the safe number for China imports is probably the TRQ number, about seven million metric tons. Uh, that's probably what we'll finish up this year with. I will challenge that number for next year at about 7 million metric tons. I'd be so bold as this morning as to suggest that number may be closer to 20 million metric tons and close then to 10 this coming year. So I, I'm quite, and this may be the people I spoke to last night, I'm quite optimistic China imports. Uh, 
an additional 10 million metric tons into China, I don't think is going to significantly change the, the overall balance sheet, um, but it will lend good support to the market going forward as, as we enter into the, to the, to the harvest season. <clears throat> Looking at that price relationship in China, this is the USDA graph they put out. I think this is about right, although I think corn's come down a bit, uh, Chinese corn's come down a bit since this has been put out. Uh, the price relationships are showing good, uh, good reason to import corn even beyond the uh, TRQ number of 7.2 million metric tons. The other thing I always like to keep in mind is uh, China can import corn in the form of meat, whether that's beef, pork, or, or poultry. <coughs> These are USDA numbers. Those are sort of my general comments, and I'm about out of time here, so I'll pass this on to Dan and be happy to answer questions at, at the end. So, Dan. oh, just one footnote for the sorghum guys out there as well, China. Look, I've got to continue to be quite bullish on sorghum exports as well into China as we move forward. So I think we're going to continue to see quite strong grain sorghum numbers uh, moving forward into new crop grain as well. All right. Thank you. Dan? Okay. Thank you, Guy, for your presentation. So uh, now uh, let's move to the second presentation by uh, Dr. Daniel O'Brien. And uh, <coughs> Move to a question and uh, answer at the end of uh, the second presentation. Please, Daniel. Okay. Move something around here real quick. All right. Okay. Um, I thought I'd give you a, a um, picture of the psychology of the U.S. grain market. And that's, you see that in the prices and the bids that we're showing. So again, it's always good to double check. Now I'm advancing that. Can you see that scrolling when I do that? As yeah, I move that. Good, yes, okay, good. Yeah. Okay, I'll do one other thing here. View. Anyway, we'll go with that. The, um, so in terms of the gray market outlook, you can see uh, here we got have Friday's closing prices. Of course, we'll be coming into that. These are closing US prices and uh, the you see D's corn for new crop bids at 357. That's that's indicative of you know that's up 20 30 cents from where we had been at 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 the low uh, in in that market. Indicative of some concern about whether uh, some some cutback in acreage. Uh, again, I'm, and we'll we'll show that from 97 to 92 million acres of corn planted. A little bit of increasing sorghum. Other other changes. Uh, actually the um, an estimate uh, as of June one of twelve million acres of, of uh, soybeans yet unplanted, two million as of June, you know, early June, uh, a little over two for corn. So uh, you've seen some concern in the market, but nothing that's that's indicative of of uh, of full buy-in, full acceptance that that uh, from from market watchers that there are major problems in in the in the corn market. You would, I think you see also still some carry in that market. Uh, not a lot of, uh, not as much, um, well, a small amount of, of, uh, of carry as you go forward there. Uh, Guy, you touched on some of the international things. Uh, I do have something to, uh, that's a little bit supportive here to show with regard to uh, the uh, Dow Jones industrial usage. Again, the recover from the bottom that, that we'd seen in, in March, April, uh, up to where we're at, where we've been at here in June, and now kind of a moderation off of that. Uh, the U.S. dollar, there you do see uh, the dollar having come off of its its um, strongest highs that you'd seen in, in March. And I think that was associated with days in which the U.S. Treasury said, "Well, the U.S. Fed said, whatever it takes, we'll do it." So uh, they've come off of that, and, and now you can see, if anything, we've weakened some since. Weakened a fair amount, almost back to uh, Jan. Well, basically down to uh, uh, December, January levels. So take that for what it's worth. I know for your business, uh, where you're sitting at the value of the dollars, guys, as Guy had mentioned, as big, big, big thing. And uh, so far, uh, we we ran up, we've come back down, and uh, kind of neutral to probably somewhat positive on the export side. Uh, you would see for us again. Here in the U.S., if we don't use grain for feed or for 
for uh, exports, we use it for ethanol. And really, uh, and I guess I'd view that in, a, in another way. We, we're, we're taking care of the domestic ethanol industry and we have livestock feeding. And sometimes when we look back, again, I put this on the floor, floor for discussion. When we've looked back in the past on, on uh, when exports have gotten low, well, it's gotten crowded out by domestic usage, particularly when ethanol was running up. So here you see some recovery in the ethanol industry and the USDA supply demand numbers uh, for the old crop uh, was down, down about 50 million bushels, but not near, not near as bad as it could have been in this old crop year ending August 31st. And uh, as, we'll take a look there, but I believe then the new crop numbers actually up for, for ethanol, well, excuse me, the USDA did, uh, didn't change that from the June projection, but 5.2 billion bushels of corn used projected for ethanol for the new crop marketing year, as opposed to 4.85 uh, in the old crop. So anticipation that ethanol will keep moving higher. Uh, you know, as, as long as we're looking at a, at a 15 billion bushel corn crop, no, no problem. Uh, you know, there's more than enough of grain and stocks still projected 2.6 billion. You know, no problem in terms of seeing uh, exports crowded out, but you know, drop, drop that 500 million, a billion bushels. And then, then you start getting into, again, a competitive crowding out effect that would, ha that would happen. P prices would move higher and we'd have to balance whether we're, we're going to use corn for these domestic uses or we're going to send it out, uh, um, send it out of the country for export. And so I guess my point is we're nowhere near that type of a crunch at this time, but we're at the critical stage. Um, of, of crop development. And let's, let's move on here, come to that. Just wanted to show you, uh, this is what I talk about every week to our uh, um, domestic audiences, to Kansas audiences. You know, we look at cash prices, et cetera. And uh, uh, note that even though the futures are just so-so, we have continued to have strong basis levels, surprisingly strong basis levels uh, for, for some of these crops. Uh, note, uh, this is for central Kansas. This would be where the export terminals are for, for sorghum in particular and some for corn. <clears throat> note the, uh, the uh, terminal bids for uh, grain sorghum, the basis bids are positive and not just a little bit, a whole lot. Uh, uh, it used to be that Topeka and Concordia stood out by themselves. It, it, you know, these are Kansas locations, but those are major, in essence, uh, well, Topeka in particular uh, is where major Cargill terminals are, Salina, et cetera. And uh, you're looking at um, Hutchinson, a 45 cent bid over the, um, the uh, September contract. So there's something, you know, this, this has the, the grain sorghum people excited because at the source where they'll be loading trains, we've got tremendous basis bids. So they're anticipating feeding that market. And uh, for corn, you look at the, the corn basis bids, they're, they're not bad, but man, sorghum is really good. So that, that's, that for me is something to really pay attention to. Uh, out in Western Kansas, uh, not as much of an issue. We're, what we grow out there, we tend to use there more so. so we'll, we'll, we'll export out of there, but, but the export terminals, uh, that, that's in Central Kansas in that, in that corridor there. So anyway. Uh, moving on here, our time again. Uh, and again, so we're we're wondering about the psychology, the health of these industries, and and it's it's really telling. And so I, I would say, if you if, if you're wondering where at your various locations around the globe, what what's happening in 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 U.S. ethanol? Do I need to be concerned about that? Go to this report because it, it'll tell you what they're bidding for corn. <clears throat> and uh, so the. Uh, I've got a Thursday report up, up here for, for that. And uh, note, noting Kansas, 35 over, 15 to 35 over bids at, for, for corn at the ethanol plants. Now the cash, what we saw before was you know, 20, 30 under. The ethanol industry, as Guy had talked about, uh, you know, anticipated to be pretty good. So you need to be watchful of that. Uh, and you can, note, you can see the trends there. Iowa, uh, Iowa distillers grains, corn prices, ethanol prices. Uh, note on that chart, uh, this, the best barometer of the profitability of that, of that industry is what are they willing to pay, what are they, what are they uh, getting paid for ethanol? And uh, note that all, everything that we lost 
we've gained back you know, during the time when, when that industry was crunched. So there you go. Um, we're concerned about weather patterns uh, and mainly that's a Western Kansas thing. And just a quick story. Uh, so I, there was an article that came out from uh, Karen Braun. Uh, Karen's from Reuters. I, I, I think Guy, probably the best domestic ag, ag journalist there is in terms of an analyst. Very, 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 very good. Karen Braun's talked about how La Nina concerns were affecting, uh, bringing about dry conditions, end of season dry conditions in Argentina and Kansas. And the Kansas parts you can see out here. Well, Kansas and other parts of, uh, of the Dakotas. <clears throat> so I forwarded this to a, a Facebook discussion group, Green, green Market Discussions. I'd, I'd advise you to get, get on there. You get, all, you get all sorts of static on it, you know, up and down, but it's, it's the best group I've seen out there. Put that up there. And I, I, after about two days, I had to take it down because all these farmers are arguing about whether, well, you know, whether there, there's risk about U.S. corn crop being, you know, is, is it made? Is it not made? Well, some of them were about one third were arguing that it was made and starting to get nasty about it. <laughs> so what's my point? The psychology of the market is that we don't know what the heck's going on. Those that have rain think, oh, it's all done. Prices are going low into harvest. There's a whole bunch of people that don't. And uh, as is our tone here in the U.S. and almost anything we discuss, we, we're arguing about it. So just just uh, take note of that psychology. But uh, drought monitor and uh, short-term drought indicators, Western Corn Belt, we have some issues. And a few things starting to happen, uh, particularly on that upper right-hand chart uh, over in Indiana, Ohio, et cetera, uh, Dakotas, Minnesota, uh, Spotty rains. Well we've, well, we've got spotty rains, and you can see that in some of this stuff down here. <clears throat> and uh, just, you don't need me to tell you this. You can see on, uh, on this July 7th international crop weather, weather um, projection talks about varying weather around the globe. <clears throat> so we had these reports and how, how all that stuff came out, et cetera. Uh, okay, I need to get to, uh, get over to another thing. Yeah, okay. Stop share on that one. I'm going to jump into something else share wise. Okay. Just greens. That's what I want. Okay. Here we go. Okay. So uh, just would note so, so okay, share. Okay. Just uh, okay. So we okay. Which one are you? Are you seeing a weekly grain market review at the top? Or are you seeing U.S. grain sorghum market information? I'm seeing the uh, weekly grain market review. Can, can you zoom in a little bit just so uh, people, it's a lot of numbers there. Yep, we'll do it. Okay, let me, uh, I have to go back to the source file and bring that thing up. So I will do that. Okay. This one out. 175. Okay, now let's come back in. Okay, is that better? Yes. Thanks. Okay, got it. Okay, so, and I've got just a couple minutes left here. Uh, so go back down through what we were looking at. Uh, and uh, just to show you quickly, um, you can see what, how the market responded to that report. Note, uh, you know, we try to follow the, when, when you look at the, on the left-hand side, what prices have done, no doubt, we have moved higher. You know, that's, that's undoubtedly the case. It, off of lows that we'd hit uh, in uh, in April, came back down to them in, in uh, early early June, had, had basically had, had jumped from about 315 up to about 355, now down to 337. So that's indicating we don't know where we're at. You know, we've got dry weather coming on, the markets, we've got bulls and bears going after one another, et cetera. And you, you can see that, uh, kind of try to follow the RSI, a relative strength index as, as one technical indicator right dead in the middle. So I, I would say we've got, in, so where we stand today is coming into uh, pollination, most a very important time frame, dry weather forecast. Uh, but we'll, we'll talk again August 1st and we'll see, by, by then I think we'll have a lot, a lot better picture on what, 
on the prospects for U.S. corn and, and in terms of production and the market. Would say, uh, again, you, there's pro pro progress stuff. You can see that in what we handed out and see the, the changes the USDA made in the supply demand balance sheet. And in, in that, <clears throat> you can see the, um, on the right-hand side for the 2021 20, marketing year, uh, dropped 5 million acres for, for projected planted acres. And again, and 2 million of that weren't, weren't in yet when they put that 92 up there. There was no change in the, in the uh, 178 and a half bushel per acre yield. Uh, so that, I, I, I'm not gonna quibble about the acres number. I think that's, that'll, we'll find that out. Uh, but, but really where the change will come would be if, if, we, if we have stress on the crop at a critical time, we'll adjust the yield. Right now, dropped just under a billion bushels off the USDA's projection. You'll drop uh, uh, at 84 million acres. You drop, drop um, you know, one or two, uh, drop, drop a uh, one bushel an acre off of that's 84 million. You know, and you start just taking two, three, four times that to, to where you get down to 14, 14 and a half thereabouts. So that's where we're at. You can see the balance sheet, uh, no change to their export projection for June, but they are, uh, we were at 1.775 as a USDA projection the last marketing year, 2.150, uh, you know, 2.15 billion bushels. So optimism in terms of US corn exports. And Guy, when you get to that, I'd invite you, you know, when we stand back and look at this, is that, what is that number? Uh, note also that, that for the ending stocks figure down, well, that, that number was 3.3 billion the last time out on this. Uh, now we're at 2.68 in flux. That's the best way to do that. That is, that's a paper number. Uh, if, if we, again, take a billion bushels off of, off of production, half a billion, you're adjusting about half of that probably off the bottom by the time you ration it. So we, we don't know. Uh, the USDA did, did uh, increase their price by 20 cents to 3.35. I would say I uh, want to get over here to sorghum, and we I know we've talked barley on these in the past, but uh, this, just want to show the sorghum balance sheet. Uh, made you, now sorghum is being priced on par with corn. That's a big deal. <clears throat> you can see that balance sheet, and um, here in your it's either Kansas or Texas you have to talk to if you're going to have anybody from the university section sector much much caring about sorghum. And uh, note, note what's happened. So at sorghum exports, 220 million bushels, that's up. Feed, feed industrial usage chopped quite a little bit from two years ago. Uh, you have food seed industrial usage uh, and, and feed usage. So right now, uh, when we look at sorghum, it, it has distinguished itself from corn. It mainly led by the, by the export prospects of it. And we, we use on the fringe, uh, so we scaled back the feed and the and the uh, and the uh, ethanol usage, basically the food seed industrial category, to to make room for exports. Exports crowded out the other side of it. So, anyways, uh, I would just to uh, not ignore what's going on with barley. Note that barley also went up 15 cents. They all went up 15 cents on these feed grains. These are the main ones we're looking at, and uh, note. Um, not a lot of focus on exports there, uh, feed, feed residual usage down. Uh, it looks like if, if anything's holding up for barley, it's, it's the food seed industrial usage categories. It is what it is. I don't watch barley as closely as I can. I think guy, you're the resident, resident KSU barley guy. So I would hand that back to you. So I've got other things there uh, that are more international in focus. You can see in the, in the, document we'd sent out but uh, as far as m my section here for where we're at domestically I, th I think those are at least the main points to bring up that we can start discussion from Thank so you. i'm good Thank thanks you for your uh, presentation it's a very very interesting one so uh let's move to uh, to question and answer and uh, i invite you to to send your uh, question and uh, click on the box uh, now I see uh, many questions, and uh, I'm inviting uh, Dan and Key to reply to your uh, request. The first one, how accurate are the SDA supply and demand reports? Or reliable? 
Domestically um, or internationally? Go ahead, Guy. Yeah, look, just um, – look, this is, this is a comment from my 30 years of commercial experience is – Bottom line is, it doesn't matter how accurate they are. The reality of it is, that's what the market trades on. So that's, that's my underlying premise. Now, the key is, which way will the USDA move, move the numbers? That's probably more important than the underlying reality, but we assume we move it closer to reality than, than away from it. Uh, so they're always a bit, a bit late. But, but they will eventually get there. And they get there quite a bit quicker than most other government re reporting agents. So the other comment I'd say on international numbers, uh, the, the key thing I think that the USDA focuses on in their international numbers it, from each country is what's the exportable surplus in exporting countries? What's the import requirements from in, importing countries? Um, and I'd say they're... They're, they're a bit slow. USDA generally, I'll let Dan expand on this bit, they generally stick pretty close to their trend line numbers, particularly on production, and aren't really too fast to move off of those unless there's a good underlying compelling, compelling reason to, to do so, uh, unless there's some major disruptors in the market. The biggest, the biggest outlier at the moment I see in the USDA numbers is, is China's ending stocks numbers, but the market I think understands that, discounts that, and they look at the world uh, excluding excluding China stock numbers. So, oh, Dan, you want to expand on that a bit? Well, just one one issue. Again, we had a very good discussion, you and I, guy, with another um, uh, U.S. Grains Council person that um, didn't last several days. And, and is is that fellow on here now? A anyway, oh, yeah, yeah um, fellow you and I spoke with by phone. Anyway. What, what strikes me is that in the U.S., when we, for so much of our calculations, again, go back, when we make adjustments, we do that, we figure up our ending stocks, and you know, we have these quarterly stocks reports, and we truth test reality of everything else based on that, because we kind of know how much, how much uh, ethanol exports, you know, at different grain inspection services, all that, and, and then we go back and we figure out, oh, gosh, we were off by X amount. You, you know, then the US, USDA is maddeningly slow in doing that, but still they do it. But, but when we look at those China numbers, uh, it, it looks like the accuracy of what they're after is, again, they're using internal scaling effects uh, in, in terms of, of feed rations, et cetera, to figure out usage. And then it's almost as if the stocks number is just a floating thing, you know, at, at the end. So it's a different, different deal altogether. Uh, in terms of it, it, and and maybe that's the case in all these countries for those international numbers, but especially China, we just they don't have a quarterly stocks figure, to, you know, and a survey that they go out and they 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 figure that out, then they truth test the rest of it, you know, what happened before. So just my observation <clears throat> for U.S. U.S. numbers, I, I think uh, until until uh, the uh, USDA, NAS goes out in the field and measures things. They get farmer surveys, et cetera. Until they go out and, and ha have those measures, we won't have a, a measured in the field number. And I think the first one of those is supposed to be, we'll, we'll have a USDA August report, but last year because of, of um, funding issues and the inaccuracy of it, they did away with in the field measures in August. So they're not going to go out to the field and measure the, anything uh, until until September. They'll have what farmers tell them in August <clears throat> and satellite data, but they won't have their in the field surveys until September, October, November. So until and before then, what you have is the Economic Research Service, World Ag Board, mainly the World Ag Board, giving their projections and what they think and see. So the accuracy, uh, it, it'll be reflective some somewhat and uh i know reese you and i have had long discussions on this of late about the the, the tendency and the psychology of uh, of the usda we're all basically we're all behavioral economists economists now <laughs> uh, they they've been very hesitant been very risk averse in 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 showing many changes maddeningly maddeningly so so anyway right now a uh, guy you're right dead on the market trades on these until until further notice and and uh, 
Uh, the frustration of that is the slowness with which when you do have a problem, when you do have a short crop, that the USDA may, be, may reflect that. And, and, and Dan, I think you brought up a good point about the USDA being very maddeningly uh, you know, hesitant to change. And I think maybe you could speak a little bit to why uh, you know, the last report was so shocking. I mean, I think that's, that was really the thing. I, I think when you looked at a lot of Twitter feeds and talked to a lot of people, you saw folks say, don't bet against the USDA. You know, history doesn't like that. Uh, but then all of a sudden they come out and change their number by, you know, their harvested number by 5.4 million hectares, you know, or 5.4 million acres, sorry. It's a huge number. So you might speak on that a little bit. Um, I, uh, next question. <laughs> That's probably the best thing to say on that. Uh, they're, they're trying, but they, but they're risk averse. And so if they saw that number, I, I thought what stood out to me was they, they gave 92 million and then they admitted, well, we're still counting up for corn plantings. And well, there's still a little, little about 2.3 that that's not planted yet. So the, the of that, regardless of the USDA psychology, the um, farmers cut back and why is the question, uh, you know, um, so it brings up a host of questions that uh, they had a whole bunch of payments uh, from the you know, MFP payments, a whole, whole number of things meant to help bolster them. And, and also I, I, I think up in the Dakotas where we had all, all that, especially North Dakota, all that late harvest that, that didn't get out. Well, there's more of an issue there in, in, in uh, soggy soils and problems. Uh, maybe you maybe those, Last thing I'll say on it is maybe North Dakota farmers aren't that anxious to plant corn for 2020 when they haven't got the 2019 crop out yet. <laughs> maybe that's, that's the psychology of what's going on here. Okay. Thank you, Dan. Let's move to the second question. Is it viable to export corn based ethanol to the MENA region? We saw some ethanol is coming to Saudi Arabia, Emirates, and uh, Oman. So it's a, it's a game between ethanol and corn. Guy? Sorry, what, the, what was the first part? Can you repeat the question there? I didn't catch ah, the first part. Is it viable to export corn based ethanol to the MENA region? Um, yeah, I haven't been that, that close to the international ethanol numbers. So I can't really a answer that question with a, with a lot of accuracy so let, let me let me hop in on something i i that that i think it, at, at least gets us in the ballpark of that okay one more screen share here so uh, again so you see again going back to the okay this is the this is the friday ethanol report number and uh you're talking i think the issue had to do with ddg exports right <clears throat> so uh, I see Iowa DDG, you can see the Iowa DDG price, it's a little bit fuzzy there and, and that chart, the lower, the bottom of these charts on the lower side. Yeah, uh, looking at ethanol here. Oh yeah, ethanol, okay, sorry. I thought I, thought I heard DDGs. Uh, well, I, we, for weekly ethanol prices across all these states, you can see all of those, they've, they've come back, back up uh, and um, I guess I need to, I need to, it, that answer can be found. I don't have it off the top of my head. I would say that the, that extremely low prices uh, that, that we had been seeing, and you can see what it dropped to back in, in April, that, that would have, uh, you know, that would be a, a, a demand pull, situ, a demand offering situation and would have been, been taken advantage of. So now we're back up to 120 for prices generally. So in, in terms of the, uh, if, so if you're back to where you were at 120 and, and, and we're, you know, so what's the other factor we look at? Well, we look at the, at the currency, the U.S. US currency is weakened some. So in terms of what, when you ask me what's, what's going on with ethanol and imports, I say, well, what's the, what's the price we have to offer it at? The domestic man, demands come back up to where we basically wipe, this is a bad term to say, guy, if you report me this uh, we we wiped out what happened <laughs> we've got our price all back and now but but what's weaker now is is the currency so it may, that would that would help help ethanol to be at least price competitive and then 
that'll then the answer to that depends on what's going on on the other side. You know, what are their domestic, what are their demand pulls? And I don't have a, um, I don't have a, a, a answer on the tip of my tongue on that uh, one. Absolutely, Dan. And uh, it's uh, definitely viable. And uh, it depends also between the arbitrage between ethanol and corn, and yeah. sometimes also between uh, ethanol and DDGs. We saw also some DDGs uh, ship it to, to MENA region the last two months or so. Okay, next question. Ah, this is for you, Dan. What's the name of the Facebook group that you mentioned it earlier? Grain market discussion. Uh, and uh, you don't want to go in there and uh, tell them you, these are a bunch of farmers. If, if they sense, if they sense that you think you have all the answers, you'll basically walk out of there bloodied and beaten. So I just want you to know to go go into it. It's it, and you'll see everything. But you'll see you'll see the range of the psychology. Like there's like twenty thousand people on this thing. So uh, grain grain market discussion, just Facebook group. A, I got fella a broker by the name of Roger Wright. W R I G H T is the is the person that runs it and. Uh, I, I, I try to go on there once or twice a week when I have, have an article to contribute, so. Okay, thank you. Next question uh, regarding uh, sorghum. So we need to promote more sorghum uh, export to MENA region as a feed ingredient. We saw uh, some sorghum uh, flowing to Saudi Arabia two, two years ago, some cargoes. Uh, especially uh, following the the vessel routing from uh, from China to the Middle East area, mainly Saudi Arabia, and uh, some of the vessels uh, uh, ship it to uh, Spain, mainly and to to the Med Sea. So, anything else to to add? There is about sorghum and the arbitrage between I, sorghum. No, and I just want to say, just in general, it really is a great feed ingredient for those that are unfamiliar with it. You know, it does have a bit higher protein. Than <laughs> there is some serious value in using sorghum. Right now, the prices don't necessarily work because of Chinese demand. Um, but just know that they will work someday. And so understanding how to use sorghum is very important. Um, and if you need any technical support in that arena, please let us know and we'll be happy to help you. Guy, if, and yeah. answer well, that question. You, you remember that yeah. discussion we had the other day and sorghum came up and there were some issues that I thought were surprisingly positive. Yeah, look, the uh, Reese hit the nail on the head. At the moment, sorghum, or sorghum's priced quite well against corn and particularly barley, talking about Saudi Arabia because they're a big bar feed barley importer. So I think it's going to be a struggle from a price perspective to uh, – to uh, get sorghum to go in there. Sorghum does handle pretty well in those hot, hotter climates and, and stores a bit. The key, the key issues to uh, address the nutritionists and the, my experience is uh, you're feeding the nutritionist, not necessarily feeding the, feeding the animal. So if you get a Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas trained nutritionist, they're, they're a lot more open to sorghum in the ration than others. Um, Bar barley is probably, and given China's, uh, who's the biggest barley importer, their tariff they put on Australia, 80, over 80% 80 import tariff. It's going to change some of those trade flows, and Australia is recovering from their droughts. So they're going to have exportable barley this year, which traditionally does go into Saudi Arabia. So I think it has potential, but I think the price situation, and I'm quite bullish sorghum values, particularly relative to corn, for the next 12 to 18 months, given Chinese demand, I think it's going to be a struggle from a price price perspective. So maybe maybe we want to be a bit smarter on our timing on uh, on addressing that that issue, just from a price point of view. Now, maybe I, I, go ahead. You want to say quickly, you know, and historically, um, you know, while these prices are very elevated, historically we've seen when China does leave the market for any given reason, prices mm -hmm. collapse. Um, so just know that they're, you know, who knows what will happen with China. I, I'm not, you know, sitting here wondering what we're going to do uh, with our political relationship between the U.S. and China. However, if that political relationship does go south and the phase one agreement does crumble, sorghum prices will fall like a rock uh, and they will go very quickly to 90 percent the value of corn like that. And so understanding and being ready for when that happens 
is very important. So, and, and, and I say this all over the world. If you don't know how to use sorghum, learn to use it because there will be a time where it can make you a lot of money. Ramey, I have a question to throw, throw to your group too, just for consideration. In yeah. the Western, it has to do with wheat, wheat and wheat, wheat exports. Um, in the Western third of Kansas, we've had quite a bit of wheat that's low test weight, 53, 54, high protein, uh, 16, 17, 18%. Well, and that's what happens in some of that, those dry areas. We had some frost risk. So the, so we, question has come up uh, as to, you know, what, what, will we, what will we be able to do with, with, with that? Do we keep it around and blend it? Uh, will the export market, that's mainly, if it's the export market's mainly focused on price, as opposed to quality characteristics, maybe, you know, maybe you'll find people that, that'll take cheap wheat, uh, high protein, but, but lower quality, and, and it'll go to export channels. So right now, this is a big thing. We just had wheat harvest. We've got a, a, not so much in central Kansas, but the western third of Kansas, you may find wheat in quant quantity at low test weight, high, high protein that, you know, buyers may, I, I, I'm, I'm not, uh, I, I've never quite recovered from that Athens meeting that I went to when these, all those buyers told me, oh, it's just price and uh, we'll just make the millers locally. They just have to deal with it. <laughs> you know, that's sort of the picture I got. But so, so here we have it, have a deal where they're li likely to have some low protein wheat and, you know, will they buy it? Will that go to export or will, because the other domestic uses are domestic millers don't want it. You know, they're not going to want that here in the U S. So I just would lay that out to you to be thoughtful of it that, that's kind of an emerging situation here in, at least in the Kansas, Kansas, Colorado, even worse really in, in Eastern Colorado than what we got here. Uh, absolutely, Dan. Good, uh, good information. Uh, generally in uh, North Africa and Middle East, they import uh, feed wheat and uh, they substitute it uh, with, with corn. And uh, some, uh, some countries uh, need to, to color it because normally they have to use it for the feed uh, federation instead of uh, food uh, business. But uh, good to know. And uh, la last year, uh, North African country import some, uh, some feed wheat from uh, Black Sea market, mainly from Ukraine and uh, Russia. So yeah. good to know. And maybe there is some opportunity to export this uh, wheat to, uh, to the Mediterranean Sea area, let's say. Okay. Next question. Uh, how the price of crude oil will impact the price of corn? I get they talk about Chicago Board of Trade. Great guy. Um, look, the, uh, the price of crude oil is the second thing I look at in the morning when I, when I wake up. First thing I look at is the exchange rate. Second thing I look at is the price of crude oil. Uh, look, there's a, there's a direct correlation on that, and uh, it's uh, the, the, there's a heavy, heavy correlation on, on the crude oil, particularly on the ethanol side of things. That's from a U.S. situation, 40, I believe it's 30, close to 40% of our domestic consumption is in the ethanol sector, just slightly behind the, the feed sector. So it's, it's, a, it's a key component, and, and particularly as the U.S. is the driver of, of world price on that. So, so yeah, we watch that very, very closely. We're, we're, uh... I'm not sure how many of you on here I remember the TV show Dallas. That was J.R. Ewing. Well, we're all J.R. Ewing now, <laughs> you know, because of, of the strong usage, uh, the inelastic demand for ethanol. Uh, and, and so what affects the, the energy markets and motor fuel market, it's driving the corn market. You know, we, we've got that now for, again, for next year projecting, 5.2 billion bushels out of 14.6 going to going straight to ethanol and and the other 14.25 1.4 going to uh you know what uh high, high fructose corn, corn syrup things like that but as far as direct ethanol so you got that's a third so and, and, and it's the most inelastic of those demands so the e ethanol usage drives a good chunk of the corn market so it, it's a big deal Thank you. Next question coming from uh, West Africa, from Nigeria. How's the corn uh, outlook uh, looks for uh, West Africa, mainly Nigeria, or especially for Nigeria? 
Uh, look, I don't, I don't have those numbers off the, off the top of my head on that. The, uh, particularly for, uh, for, for West Africa there, my, my biggest, the biggest issue for Africa is, is the South African situation where they're dropping production due to, due to dry weather. And uh, they, they sort of really, really feed and supply that, that's, that whole Southern Africa situation on that. So I'm sorry, I, just, I don't have a Nigeria specific. Um, I, guy, I do. I'm, surprisingly, oh, I do. <laughs> I pulled that off of the, the USDA uh, uh, grain production report. Let me pull that up real quick. And, you know, these, a lot of times you just throw these tables in for reference is what you do. So do you, do you see that table four corn area yield production? Is that yeah. showing? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So you see area yield production. Uh, I need to move something out of the way. And then uh, some stuff over here on the side. Yeah. Change in production. So Nigeria, you see there, it looks like in a nutshell, uh, no change in planted air and in heart in area million hectare 6.5 uh, from 1819 1920 their yield uh, also unchanged you know what whoever's whoever's doing the, the, the Nigeria numbers is is straight lining it <laughs> you know because they, they're showing 11 million metric tons so you, you know what this is if, if you're a if you're a a, a scandalous grain trader and you really were making money off of this i i'd be like cargill and have my own eyes on the ground and and know that the usda isn't isn't paying a lot of attention to this you know so if there's movement uh, it's not being the usda is just straight line showing it showing it so i i don't doubt that there's more variability than that number is 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 showing and probably has been but so so that's not a good answer other than then the world markets, if they're following USDA numbers, they're they're not representing anything. I, I I'd get some local market intelligence and and, and beat and beat that information set. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I would just add that that's that the USDA is also looking at the the balance sheet for world trade, and so Nigeria is not going to be showing up as high right in, in, or in the in the trading environment. So somebody based in Nigeria obviously would have a much better sense of that. Yeah, and 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 they'll and they'll make their they'll make their money off basis, you you know, in uh, in arbitrage in those situations. Okay. Next one uh, coming from uh, this. How do you see the purchasing power of consumers, and how do you see the grains future under COVID nineteen? Um. Look, I think the, the impact directly on the grain market of COVID-19 has been, been minimal, particularly from a U.S. situation. Um, we're, look, we're bulk handling uh, supply chain, don't necessarily need a lot of, a lot of people, highly mechanized, and there's been very minimal dis disruption on that. The biggest change in the demand sector has probably come from the, the meat side of things, and, and We've, I've talked about that in the past, and uh, in the changing, the, the change from institutional food consumption to more the home retail food consumption changes the type of product and, and meat that, that we, the consumer's been buying and the price relationships. Also, while the meat supply chain has recovered, specifically in the processing uh, abattoir sector, where we re it really focused the uh, the COVID situation and, and the shutdown, we, we are operating with reduced capacity in, in the uh, processing sector. And we still have a bit of a backup of live animals versus product. And that's highlighted in, in the price spread. Uh, while they're all back up and operating, they're not operating at 100%. And I'd suggest that part of the sector is still, uh, still adjusting on that. And I think economists, uh, probably more so in the wheat situation with with bread consumption it, are trying to reassess and requantify what it's done to the to the demand shift but from a grains point of view we're still seeing very strong demand for for meat and the feed sector the ethanol side recovered quite quickly we're happy to see that that was not a covid situation that was a saudi russian oil dispute well part of the covid because we saw the transportation oil demand drop off um, 
but that uh, the the feed sector remains strong. We've got world record world consumption, record feed consumption this year, even even in the wake of that. So uh, keeps me optimistic. And, Dan, do you uh, have comments? Yeah, I'm in the you know, we all struggle and grope to figure out where this thing's going. But if you go to that WASD report back on the July WASD report on uh, table 32, you can see at least what they're putting out for numbers for red meat demand. There's kind of a supply demand balance sheet, you know, a rough one there for beef, pork, et cetera. And no projection that meat usage is going down, which is an indicator on the U S economy. And uh, heaven help me. I want to say this right. What surprises me is that our, you know, um, the view of, of where things are going in terms of stock market, et cetera, affected some. But here we have major, major problems in our inner, inner cities, you know, a, 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 a lot of problems. And, and yet that's not viewed as enough of a drag on the U.S. economy that it's affecting the stock market or meat consumption or something. So it's, it's kind of... So are we all moving to the suburbs or what's going on? I'm not sure, but, but uh, it, it's a very thought provoking thing. To me, I don't see how, you, how disruption, and some of those things can't affect us, at least to some degree. But in the, I think, uh, Kurt, to your overall di thing, that we're, the aggregate view is that, hey, people are gonna eat, you know, and, and uh, we'll pull from there. And with that, I, there's my there's that bell again. That's that's pretty effective stoppage for Dan O'Brien when I hear the bell ring. So, okay, let's let's move to the corn again. If you were corn buyers, what will you do today? Buy, wait. Uh, I would not speculate. Uh, you know, this is just just my deal. If you're a buyer, you need consistent flow. And right now, you've you've you know, we've had issues up and down, et cetera, and the futures have only gone up 20 cents. I think I'd buy, <laughs> you know, I, 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 if you, I, I would buy and, and lock in my supplies. <clears throat> the odds right now of, of where, of, of the market, of the, of the U.S. corn production numbers in the market going up and down from here, the odds are probably still leaning, is it at least 50% that we'd be going lower into harvest. You know, a lot our fears most of the time don't come to fruition, uh, but but uh, if if, if uh, on when we were sitting on March first, you asked us what's the odds of a drought, a short crop this year? Historically, twenty five percent, twenty five percent. You know, when you're out of four, we get something like that. So here we're into this. We're un unknown. We have lower lower product lower acres. Uh, we have risk of production. We're right entering into the barrel of the next 30 days to figure out where this corn crop's gonna be. And we've only, and with a fair amount of uncertainty, you've seen the maps, we've only, we're only at 357 D's corn. I, I think that's, I, I, I don't see that as, I don't see the 357 you have now worth taking the risk of 457 if you get something short, you know, of having to take that when you're, you're probably gonna end up at 337 out in December. I, I personally would keep buying my inventory just so I'm not, not caught short. Uh, I, I don't think the 357 Dees corn you saw on Friday is, an, is a disincentive, but that's, that's just my inventory management perspective. Look, my, my initial comment would be if you're post farm gate and you're effective at managing risk, if you can lock in a profit margin, do the prudent thing and manage, manage, your, uh, manage your margin. Um, for all the flat price cowboys out there, um, look, Dan, Dan touched base on it earlier. We're seeing a very, very strong basis, uh, not only in Kansas, but along the river. Um, just my comments on China have made me bullish exports. That's going to continue to leave basis fairly strong as we, we approach delivery value equivalent. Uh, something an old mentor of mine told me uh, 30 years ago. He was also a K-State graduate. Basis leads futures, cash leads futures. We're, uh, we have a strong basis. That's an indication that uh, it makes me rather rather bullish or very supportive flat price on that. So uh, I, I remain pretty optimistic flat price views going forward. Even, even as we go into harvest, I think even with a 
the harvest isn't so big that we can't manage it. So I think it's going to be managed fairly well. The fact that we had big stocks numbers, which should have widened spreads out, the basis has, uh, has comp you know, compensated for that. Farmer's been a very, very slow, flat price seller. Uh, the market's going to have to rally before it gets, gets rewarded on that. So I guess I'm quietly uh, growing my bullish horns a bit. But, so. but we're, we are right, and I agree, we're right there, though. We're at pollination for corn and forecast of high temperatures. So the next couple, two, three weeks is going to be a big, big thing. Uh, so be, be watchful. Um, and what will happen is people will wonder, well, we'll wait and we'll see what the odds are probably going to be in our way. It, be their direction, you know, it won't be a problem. We'll have okay prices in the fall. But then if you get, if, if you get a bad hit on the crop, uh, you know, high temperatures, high nighttime temperatures, uh, then uh, you'll kind of know that by August 10th. You know, you'll have a pretty good idea of where, where you're at. And then, and then they have to reassess how much risk on the high side they want to go. Um, it, it's a heck of a conundrum because if the market starts to panic, it tends to overreact to the high side when it doesn't know things. So, you know, so you're sitting here, you're probably not going to have much of a market. You know, it'll probably be just fine, but give us, <laughs> give, give us high temperatures, et cetera. The market starts to panic. Then, then this question, Ramey, comes back in spades, you know, you know, what, what do you do? Do I, do I jump in on that? And uh, some cool heads will probably wait and, and let, let all the, let the worry blow off and then come back later. Probably won't be that bad, but, but that question will be right in front of them. Yeah. There's a, uh, another question also talking about uh, the weather and the uh, fans. They said corn futures made a tough decision and uh, they are looking for uh, fans and uh, weather situation. So how do you read the current situation about the funds uh, position? The funds position? Yeah. Uh, I normally watch that. I, I have not, I did not take the Friday numbers and, and, and update that. We, we had had, uh, had been pretty pessimistic, you know, for a good long time, you know, based uh, for the, for the, um, for the, um, um, yeah, the, the specs basically the quote the managed managed uh, marketers uh so uh, again i i have not looked at the friday numbers the cftc came out and it, it, it's very doable uh maybe what i can do in the next day or so i can get that get that those numbers together and send it to you um okay for, for corn and i will forward it to all uh, our attendees that'd be great uh, the next one, with the huge 2020-2021 uh, 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 crops in the US, Brazil, and Ukraine, is there a remaining fears about supply of corn? No, look, I, look, the supply situation, I think we're quite comfortable on. I guess uh, I, I acknowledge the lateness of the crop and we're in the middle of the pollination season, but I don't... Uh, um, I mean, every day I'm increasingly comfortable with that and I'm sort of looking more forward to the demand situation and the demand surprises there. It's a bit harder to quantify. Um, and I guess I'm quite optimistic the demand, uh, both look, ethanol's recovered, and I think gonna continue to be strong. Uh, the feed situation, uh, you've got, I, I'm increasingly optimistic on that. And I think there's some importers out there that, that need China being the biggest one that are going to step up to the plate. And uh, I think we're going to see relatively stronger uh, buyers in, in that in that import market. So uh, yeah, I think uh, even though we've got record supply, we do have record demand. And that said, your the carryover stocks are still, still quite comfortable, particularly I, you know, even outside of China. A lot of carryover stocks, we're going to need a big demand shock to move price significantly. I, I'm 75% in agreement with you. Okay. <laughs> it's that 25% that yes. where, where we get things we don't anticipate, but yeah, the, the normal mode is 75, 80%. Yeah. That's probably where we're going to end up at, but it's not set. Okay. This is about supply. Well, uh, the next one will be about uh, demand considering everything, for example, impact of COVID and China buying, are you bullish corn in the next three months? 
I think I've made it pretty optimistic, pretty obvious. I'm a bit optimistic uh, corn price here. So yeah, I, that's uh, I think that's come through in my comments. Yes. So, so if I get the drift of that, are they? Is it is the essence of that question? Is they're wondering if demand will hold up. Is, is that is that kind of what they're getting at? Yeah, this is a question about China demand. Oh, China demand. Yeah. China buying? Are you bullish corn in the next three months? I, I, I certainly I'd agree, guy, with what you said, and would defer on on that one. Okay. The next one will be for Guy. Guy, at uh, the beginning of your presentation, you said that uh, you watch it every morning, uh, other than oil. What commodities are you watching? What commodities am I watching? Yeah. Um, well, look, the, the the corn, the corn, the wheat are, are my main focuses, and then and then the soybean, oil seeds. Uh, those are the main drivers across the complexes. The other, the other commodities, and as Dan said, I do watch some of the uh, smaller commodities: sorghum, barley, canola, et cetera. Uh, look, day trade is a relationship to that, but it's I'm not quite as religious as I used to be when my my daily P and L and monthly performance was all dependent. Uh, specifically on that, but uh, look, I watch. I watch the gold price. The foreign exchange is the first thing I look at. I look at the. Uh, I look at the stock markets, uh, and particularly recently, as Dan put up there, we we have seen a V-shaped recovery on that, and that sort of gives me underlying confidence on the health of the economy, and it's sort of a proxy for the demand situation. You know, with a with a recovery in the in the Dow and the New York Stock Exchange and other exchanges around the world, it tells me, despite what you listen to on the six o'clock news, the the disruptions not not nearly what you would you would think it is watching the, watching the television set. So those are sort of the macro pictures that I watch, and I do listen quite closely to sort of the trade discussions coming out from the uh, U.S. Trade Representative offices. And because uh, they'll they'll be they'll be uh, call it coded messages within those press releases that they're telling you on which way things are are headed. That might be a bit harder given the current technology and tweets, but uh, look, the information's in there and it's pretty direct. It's pretty pretty direct from the people making those decisions. Guy, is it fair to say that we should tell people uh, to? Um... You know, from now to the U.S. election, it's going to be a very the, – the new at least the news that will be out there is going to be extremely volatile. People will wonder what they're seeing. You know, I, I think we're in, in for a real political struggle. And uh, so don't uh, – maybe it's time to tell them to go on vacation, you know, not, not to watch the news, uh, whatever. But it, it, if anything, it'll, it'll – this is likely to be a very if, – if, if they hang on on Reuters news reports – that they're, they're going to be shook up and not sleep very well because that's just how this thing is shaking up. Yeah, so. no, look, I was going to say, Dan, just t turn off your, turn off your TV set, particularly the, uh, the political commentators. Uh, they're in the, they're in the uh, business of selling, uh, selling news. And um, yeah. And, and that's the challenge for any trader or marketing person is, is you've got to strip out the emotion. Uh, Dan and I tend to be pretty hardcore economic rationalist fundamentalist and uh, taking all the emotional stuff stuff out of it um so yeah and i i think he's you're exactly right dan for the next couple months leading up to the election uh you know not too dissimilar i think the brexit situation in europe uh, i think had the same sort of uh, underlying emotions about it and depending on you know in australia when i talk to my australia colleagues the australia china thing has got everybody all riled up uh and they're and they're increasing closeness with India. So whatever market you're looking at, you've got to be able to strip the the emotional and the sensational news out of the uh, out of the equation and say, while it can have impact, you know, minimalize it and uh, and what's the reality of the situation? But that's that's why Dan and I are economists. There's there's a famous economist, Robert Schiller, that made hay made his career by saying, you know that the underlying fundamentals of these markets, he said the underlying value of companies wasn't near as much as, as the variation in the stock price. So that the under, 
And I think we would hold to that. The underlying fund, supply demand fundamentals of gray markets are, are probably more consistent than, than the emotions that, that go into the, into the futures prices that overlie them. The, the last question in, uh, in the box, it's uh, about China, China again, uh, the lack of, uh, let's say, clarity about US corn outlook and uh, stocks in, uh, in China. So what, what we can do to reach uh, reliable uh, information or data? Um, yeah, that's a good question. And that's something I've sort of been been uh, challenged with for the last 20 years, and particularly when I was working in China. Getting good information coming out of China is, is a challenge. And what I've learned to do is I sort of have a handful of reliable contacts that I trust their, their insight and their perspective on that. And, and, and you need to talk to, to a range of people across, across the industry because uh, everybody has a bit of a different perspective, otherwise you'll get, you'll get blindsided. So, but I'd say to boil it all down, look, markets are pretty efficient, uh, even, even in China with a centrally uh, planned economy. Uh, that what tells me a lot and confirms a lot of my speculation is actually what's the price of corn or what's the price of beans in China. And that day in, day out, that'll, that'll confirm or, uh, or discredit your underlying assumptions on that. And today we have the price of corn that's telling us China's gonna, Im should be importing a lot, of, a lot of corn in the next 12 months. You know, not very similarly, what's the price of pork? Now, the price of pork in China is highly correlated to the consumer price index. Matter of fact, they call the, the uh, CPI the consumer pork index. It's just highly, highly cor correlated. So those, you know, look, look at the market values because they'll, uh, they'll confirm the situations and markets are pretty efficient and pretty right. Okay, thank you. Any other question? No, no question on the box. Okay, uh, thank you gentlemen for all your questions. And uh, you can join both uh, Dan and Guy for further uh, requests by, by email. As I said uh, at the beginning, uh, I will send you uh, later both presentation of uh, Daniel and uh, Guy. And uh, I'm taking uh, this opportunity to thank uh, both the speakers for their uh, great works and uh, the success of uh, this webinar. I would like also to thank you again for joining uh, this webinar uh, this morning or this afternoon, and I hope to see you soon in the upcoming uh, ones. Take care. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank appreciate, you. appreciate being a part of it. Thank you. <laughs>